Good morning. We'll open a quick word of prayer. Father God, we just pray that today as we uh, go into your word that you would touch hearts and minds, that you would draw us closer to what's in your word, Lord, that we would learn and that we would uh, learn your heart. And we ask in your name. Amen. So we're going to uh, continue today with 2 Corinthians, and we'll be starting a new chapter, chapter 6. Um, kind of picking up where we, we left off last week, I wanted to just kind of stop a minute, kind of give a little bit of a brief under, understanding or a recap of, of what where we are. We're heading towards the end of a large section of Scripture that um, Paul, where Paul de basically defends his ministry. This section stretches from approximately the t 11th or 12th uh, verse of chapter 1 to uh, the end of chapter 7. And it seems that we can agree, uh, even in the times we're in now, that it's human nature to grumble and complain. And that was certainly true of the first century church in Corinth. This led Paul to include an extensive defense of his ministry and those who ministered with him. So basically it was a, re, a, a stating or a restating of his credentials and focusing not on what necessarily man thought was important, but what God thinks is important. This section of scripture uh, is noted in the New King James Version as marks of the ministry. But I like how the Phillips New Testament calls it the hard but glorious life of God's ministers. And as you talk to any minister, and I, I haven't ministered that much, but uh, I've known many in my life, ministers of the gospel who have dedicated their life to the ministry. And I've seen firsthand that it is not always uh, something in which you skate right through. And I, I have a lot of admiration, admiration for men and women, some still with us and some who've passed that have decided to take this path even though it was difficult. In chapter 6, in the first uh, three verses, we see a plea to regard God's goodness, God's grace for the treasure it is, and not to take it for granted. Uh, in, in recent years, there's been a, uh, a talk about a cheap grace. And, and if, if you really have an understanding of the price that was paid on Calvary, there's, you can't cheapen the grace. Uh, the, the grace that was given us is, is amazing. It's almost indescribable. And we need to give it the, the due that it, it's worthy of. So we start off and it says, uh, the first, uh, second, third verses, he says, Then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Um, there's a hymn that I remember as a, as a, as a young person, and I used to play it and I and sing it with my dad. It was a beautifully written little hymn. Uh, it was written in 1865 by a lady named Elvina Hall, who was a, who was a, a, a widow and she was sitting in a choir loft in a, in a church and she wrote this, uh, the words of this song down. It's called Jesus paid it all. She was writing it on the back of a hymnal while sitting in the choir loft at the Monument Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. She gave it to the pastor who then turned and gave it to uh, the church organist who happened to also be a coal merchant named John Grape who wrote the music. Mrs. Hall and uh, Mr. Grape worked together to complete the hymn. In the hymn, Mrs. Hall wrote, For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garment white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We refer to grace a lot, uh, especially in evangelical circles. We also know that grace and mercy are often mentioned together. Webster uh, talks about grace as the enjoyment of divine favor. And mercy is defined as compassion extended to someone instead of severity. And I think when we look at the sacrifice on the cross, which Paul con continuously goes back to as it is his main core message. It is the message that justifies uh, for him the, the reason why he takes risks, uh, risks his, his uh, reputation and everything. It's the message that is core to who Paul is. But um, it's certainly true that uh, 
God in God, mercy and grace are connected, but they're not identical. We more simply, we can agree with A.W. Tozer, who said, grace is to pit the wretched, spare the guilty, and welcome the outcasts. And I think that's a great way to put grace. Once we receive this grace that Paul talks about, where he says, he says, I plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Uh, once we receive this gra grace, Paul seems to imply that something is expected of us or we could face the danger of receiving, God, uh, re receiving the grace of God in vain. In verse 1, we find ourselves really in the beating heart of chapters 1 through 7. Uh, we talk about how, you know, this is Paul's defense of his ministry. He spent the last several chapters preparing the people at Corinth for the appeal that he makes right here in these verses. Paul has spent the last five chapters presenting his credentials as a minister of the good news of Jesus Christ or the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we mentioned before, it wasn't the kind of credentials his detractors waved around and thought were important. He probably didn't have a parchment signed by the theology department head at the Library of Alexandria, but they were credentials that mattered that on the ground he conducted ministry that changed lives. In the first three verses, Paul is uh, just identifying himself as a servant in the vein of what we see in Isaiah 49.8, a scripture that the people at, in Corinthian people would have been likely familiar with, where he equates receiving God's grace with accepting the ministry of him and his co-workers. It seems uh, there was always a risk that the Corinthians would reject Paul and his ministry. That seemed to be that constant thing that, they, that Paul was trying to stay ahead of or prevent from happening. Paul was cautious not to do anything that someone could rightly be offended by. And I think there's something to be learned there. I think that the truth needs to be always out front and, and, and the point. But we need to relay the truth without offense, if at all possible. Because uh, we know that the gospel can offend. Because we are told in, in the first uh, book to the Corinthians, or at least the first one we have in the Bible, is, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. So we know that there's some offense in the message that we, that we, we teach or we preach. But we should not offend the, the minister himself in his own should not offend. Uh, so we're going to enter another section here, uh, verses uh, 4 through 10. And again, this is a, another section where we kind of talk, we talked about the curriculum vitae or, a, or a, like a resume. Um, but we'll, we'll take a look at these, at these verses. And instead of reading them all, we'll take them one by one. Uh, this is the second resume that we see, and it's very similar to the list that was given to us in chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. In brief, the attributes are divided into groups. Uh, the first group of 18 can be divided into missionary hardships, ethical virtues, and spiritual weaponry. Paul starts with nine varieties of suffering that he experienced as a minister of the gospel. And these are well documented and some are going to be reviewed for a lot of us. Of all of these listed, only riots does not appear in the other list. But he mentions riots, which is obviously not a, a uh, flowery, enjoyable topic. These difficulties require a firm stance and represent internal and external pressure of some kind, troubles or hardships or distresses. And that's an important point. Not only were the pressures internally, but the pressures were externally as well. The next group of difficulties we see are the ones that are inflicted by others, including, including beatings, imprisonments, and, and the riots. In Romans, Paul writes about having been lashed five times by Jewish authorities and whipped three times with Roman rods. We know about Paul's imprisonment in Philippi because Luke wrote about it. The final groupings of difficulties are self-imposed and include hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. And to Paul and those that ministered with him, those were things that they clearly chalked up to the price of doing ministry. 
In verse 6, Paul includes four moral attributes that would be essential to be uh, to have to be a servant of God. These include purity, understanding, patience, kindness. And those are all things that I will be honest and say I work on constantly. Paul cared, he didn't really care much about how his peers judged him. And I think there's something of value to that as well. What I try to do is, and I used to care a lot, let me just be honest, I used to care a lot about what other people thought. And I came to the realization that what really matters is that uh, Jesus approves. And so there are times, you know, I've had to amend my behavior, my thoughts, my methods, my ideas in order to, to fit what's really important. Uh, where it's not really about me pleasing man, but it's about me pleasing God. Though I don't uh, go out of my way usually to offend man. So let's take a quick look at the, the verses. Verse 4, it says, uh, But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses. And, and these do read as a list, so it may uh, feel a little choppy if I take it verse by verse, but I think there's a value in breaking it down so that we can take a good look at each individual thing. So not only should uh, the minister of the gospel, and I, let me go back to that again. It says, but in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, tribulations, and needs and distresses. It's important that ministers of the gospel should avoid anything that might speak of scandal or bring a blight on his ministry. Because ultimately, a minister... Uh, it's not just his ministry. It's the message of God supersedes any ministry uh, that I might have as an individual or that anybody else might have as an individual. He should always be proper, lawful, proven, and approved of. Uh, he or she should have all those qualifications. They should show themselves to be true and faithful as stewards of the Word of God. And that is the ultimate uh, test, I think, is... is when you teach the Bible, do you teach it accurately? Do you teach it correctly? Are you willing to admit when you've made a mistake and make it right? Uh, and, and what your guide is? What's your message? Does the, does the Word of God determine your message or does your message determine how you use the Word of God? I think that the Word of God needs to determine your message. As ministers of God or teachers, uh, they need to demonstrate that they were chosen and called. And it says, by much patience. Bearing many things for the sake of Christ and his gospel without murmuring or being angry with men. In afflictions, this means to be patiently enduring and bearing trials. In necessities, being hungry or thirsty, uh, in dire straits or in difficulties, but continuing on with the mission that, that you've been entrusted with. So go to, to verse 5 where he says, In stripes, imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, and in fastings, in stripes, <laughs> as the Apostle Paul, uh, in particular, he was beaten with rods and scourges, and we can see that several times. And we actually know that his, the, when he died, he was, you know, ultimately beheaded. Uh, I would call that um, stripes. I would call that, you know, suffering. In imprisonments, he was often in prison for the gospel of Christ, and we can read that again. Luke told us about that. In tumults, in difficult laboring of the ministry, and in the administration of ordinances, by laboring with their own hands to supply their own needs. And we know with Paul, um, he, he made the, the case several times that he, he and his, uh, his, his team, they worked. They weren't often supported by the churches in which they ministered. So they worked, uh, Paul himself being a tent maker. Um, in sleeplessness, ministering night and day without rest. And in fastings, and, and we see these are not fastings where they've determined to fast in order to, uh, to you know, as a, as a religious uh, practice or a discipline, but in that they didn't have food. So it was more of a fasting out of a lack of provision. So we go on in the list, um, and a joyous list it is, isn't it? By, by purity in chapter 6, or verse 6, I'm sorry, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness by the Holy Spirit and by sincere love. So we see 
again, characteristics by purity, showing how he, uh, Paul and other true ministers of God showed themselves to be called and, 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 and approved of by patiently bearing their afflictions, by purity of behavior, purity of doctrine, conversation, and in, and in their personal conduct. You know, the real test of a person is not what they do when they're in public. The test of a person is how do they behave when they're in private? That's really the, that's really where you see the character of a person. And I would like to think that, that someone who is the same person publicly and privately, that they are privately, I, I, I tend to think that that's, you know, what integrity is. By knowledge, knowledge of the scriptures, knowledge of truth, and, and understanding and knowledge and acceptance of God's grace, walking in wisdom with caution and wisdom and being judicious. Long-suffering, not easily provoked, but bearing uh, indignity and conflict with patience. And that all fits into that picture that I have in my mind of grace, uh, a graceful person. By kindness, sweetness of temper, manners, courteousness, by the Holy Spirit, helping and influencing with grace by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. At some point, you know, maybe we need to talk about what those gifts of the Holy Spirit are, but they're laid out. Uh, you, I would, I would um, propose that you, 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 you know a spirit-filled person. They're, they're, they're different. And I would say by sincere love, loving not just in word, but in deed and in truth. So go ahead, uh, moving on to verse 7. And I just wanted to say too about the gifts of the Spirit. What those, are, those are given us as, as a way to supercharge our ministry. It doesn't give us extra salvation or uh, anything like that. But what it does is it, it further equips us to do the work of God. And that's really what it's for. And it's, it's, it's the fellowship that goes all the way back to Genesis when, when he said, we, you know, we made man in our image. And man being, you know, tied in with that triune God, I, I, it's just the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are just amazing. Um, so we move on to verse 7 where he says, By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. By the word of truth, preaching the gospel truly, sincerely, without changing it, and respecting it as the truth of God, which it is. Uh, again, you know, we, we're in a time where we, we can see people, um, you can often see it on Facebook, where people have an idea and then they they go to the the bible and they find a verse and they twist it to fit their idea when the truth of the matter is is you go to the bible you see what it says and you let that inform your ideas by the power of god being obedient to the move of the holy spirit the armor of righteousness putting on the full armor of god talks about on the left hand and and, and the right hand but putting on the full armor of God, being clothed head to foot with righteousness in the strength of Christ. In verse 8, we talk, he goes on, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. And again, we see here what we saw earlier, where in this section of Scripture, the last uh, three verses, 8, 9, and 10, we see uh, the, the contradictions. Uh, Paul presents us with the contradictions or the and or but statements um, by honor and dishonor by evil report or good report as deceivers and yet true by honor and dishonor being consistent with our message regardless of how we are treated as ministers or teachers by evil report or good report understanding that some will speak well of what we teach and preach and others simply will not remain pure in the message if we stick to the truth, we will be vindicated and commanded in the eyes of God. And remember, that's the judge that we should be caring about. The approval of men is temporal and it's temporary. They may be, a uh, man might be really on your side rooting for you now, but that could end quickly. The next thing you say might make them unhappy and it's your approval's gone. As deceivers, Unbelieving Jews and false apostles were probably what uh, Paul was writing to 
here in the, in the Corinthians, but unbelieving Jews and false apostles spreading errors and leading people astray. We remain steadfast in our purpose. That's keeping an eye out for those people who are, who are uh, coming among the sheep and trying to, uh, trying to steal the, wool, the wolves that come in, trying to uh, cull off uh, members of the, of the group. And yet, true, true and faithful ministers of the word remaining true to Jesus, committed to the gospel. We'll go on to verse 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed. As unknown, as, as unknown yet well known, not unknown to the Lord, but uh, known to the world. As dying and behold we live, there, there were... There were as dying men having the seeds of mortality in them, being subject to diseases which bring death, and especially as they carried about them the dying of the Lord, uh, they were continually exposed to death and in danger of it. But it was a natural body, a natural life, but we lived in a life that is eternal. So when he said... Um, as dying and behold, we live. We went through a whole section of that where he talked about, you know, in our temporal, our, our temporary bodies, our pot, clay pots that contain something far more valuable inside that, that will lead us to eternal life. As chastened and uh, yet not killed, chastened is a word we don't hear a lot, but uh, chastened or, or disciplined by, by a man and God in a fatherly manner, not killed or put to death by people who persecute us or seek to take away our lives, but living life fully until our time is done and our mission is complete. And then finally, verse 10, he says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing all things. I like those state, those di dichotomy statements. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as, as to the outward appearance, they are sorrowful. And sometimes, uh, really, so they're, we're sorrowful on our outward appearance on account of sin, uh, our sin and the sin of people around us by reasons of afflictions, temporary, temporal, uh, spiritual afflictions, and to the, to the state and the condition of the Church of Christ and, and the interest in, in the religious things instead of the relational things, our relationship with Jesus Christ, it's putting our focus on the religion the rules and the, and, and the things that keep us from focusing on the relationship. Yet we're also rejoicing. We don't rejoice in ourselves or in any other creature, but we rejoice in the Lord, in the, the person and the blood, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and the salvation that we, is accessible to us because of Him. As, as poor, yet making many rich. This uh, really speaks of... Um, Excuse me. This really speaks of the ministers in, to be poor in this world. A lot of Christ ministers throughout the world are extremely poor people, but they do it. At, they do. It's a mission. It's, it's not like they have a choice. It's a calling that they have to fulfill. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. So our rewards are not going to be of this world. Uh, the faith of men might stand in the riches of the world, but in the power of God, that ministers might not be above their work, nor neglect it, nor drop it, um, that they might not be ensnared or encumbered with the things of life. And that's, that's something that not just, yeah, we all deal with as Christians. The, the stuff of the world creeps in and it, it, it's like an ivy growing that we could just choke out the rose bush. And yet, making many rich, is, uh, we're, we're, we're basically instruments in the hands of God. God's a craftsman, I like to think. I, I had an uncle who was, a, who was a builder, and he could take things uh, and a skill saw and make things that I couldn't even conceive of making. And I think, I think of that as an analogy to what, what God is. He said, he's a craftsman and he uses us as his tools, but but his finished product is save souls. He uses us as an extension to, to reach those, those souls that are hurting and, and, and need to be brought back into fellowship with God the Father. Uh, directing them where true riches are. And we, we show them where, where wealth really lies, and that's in, 
in, in Christ and in eternity and furnishing them with a spiritual knowledge, with the knowledge of uh, things that are more valuable than uh, gold. It's having nothing yet possessing all things. And this is kind of the last thing we'll talk about. For the apostles, they left everything for Jesus Christ, were sent out by him with absolutely nothing in most cases, or they only you know, took a cloak, uh, but they didn't take out huge sums of money or huge teams. And what they had, they gave away. They were essentially destitute by the world's uh, world standards, but yet they possessed all things. That's the dichotomy that in our kind of, uh, uh, the kind of world we live in now that's materialistic, we kind of have a hard time seeing that sometimes true wealth can come shine through by putting all the material things aside. They had Christ and, and all things with him, and therefore they could say, just like Jacob did, that they had enough, and indeed that they had everything. So when we go on um, next time, and, and we go on in the, to hopefully the rest of chapter 6, we'll talk about uh, just what God says tells us to be holy, how we're not restricted uh, by Paul or people who teach us, but we're, we're we're restricted by our own affections. So we'll go on to that next time. But I would like to encourage you to say, stay strong, uh, spend time in the Word. And I would also like to encourage you to um, uh, do something that I'm trying to do, and that's spend, uh, even if it's five or ten minutes a day, in prayer for our country, our leaders, those around us who are having difficult times. It's really a, an opportunity that we have to be light in a time of darkness. I, I would just encourage you to uh, spend time in prayer. Uh, pray for our leaders, even when that's difficult to do. Uh, pray for those, our neighbors and, and people that might uh, have need, that God would find their need. But most importantly, that the love of God would shine and that Jesus Christ would shine in this, in this time we have. Father God, we're thankful for this time together. And I just pray that everyone who listens, listens to this, God, would understand that the real richness, the real wealth comes from a relationship with you and, and a kind of a putting aside or not focusing so much at least on the, on the cares and materialistic uh, things of the world, but we, that we put our trust in our, in our time and our belief and, and, and our hope in you. And we just ask for your grace and your peace for everyone. And we ask it in your name. Amen.